So we have uh, this abstract ship class. And if you did everything the way I intended for you to do, and I say that because giving a workshop where we refactor things is always a little bit complicated because there are always many ways to do something and there are, they're all kind of right and it depends on the situation. So sometimes I see uh, somebody do something and I say, actually, that's a really good solution, but don't do it that way. Please do it this way, this exact way that I'm telling you to do it, not because it's better, but because that's the way we're doing it. So if you did it the way I intended you to do it, then your um, abstract ship, it has only abstract methods in it. It has five abstract methods. It has no implementation in it at all. Okay, so if you don't have something different, then you can raise, my, you know, raise your hand when we do the next thing and, and go ahead. Yep, qu a question, comment? Oh, not right now. Yeah. yeah. If you have something different, or you have something different that you want to share, you can. No, 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 no. It's just I, I actually put all the implementation into the abstract class. Which implementation? Yeah, the setters, getters, basically everything. Yeah, yeah. So he, you threw the setters and the getters into the implementation. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the problem with that, with my giant air quotes, is that in the Jedi ship, I want the defense to be 100. There needs yeah, I mean, to be no property. Yeah, then, 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 then I'm, uh, I was not exactly clear, so, 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 so I basically implemented all the functions and, and I had two abstract functions in it, mm -hmm. which, which, which is then implemented in the concrete classes. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, I want to make even a little bit more different where it's like, no, the Jedi ship doesn't need a setter or a setter for defense or weapon power. It just, it just returns hard-coded values. Yep. So yeah, that's exactly an example where it's like, what you did was not wrong. It, it depends entirely on the requirements. So... Um, so yeah, so why do you have like those five abstract methods? But of course, the power of an abstract class is exactly what you were already doing, which is we can have concrete implementations, functions that actually do work for us. So right now, there's a function called git um, attack something something. Single attack effectiveness. Yes, git single attack effectiveness. So that's called, obviously, when the ships are battling each other to figure out um, how devastating a single attack was. And that's in the abstract class because that's the function that needs to be called in reality. Um, but the implementation of that function in normal ship and Jedi ship is basically the same. It does this random function in order to figure out if it was a, quote, devastating attack. And then if it is, it, like multiplies your weapon power by five, otherwise it just uses your normal weapon power. So normal ship and Jedi ship have this weird little algorithm I wrote for figuring out how things, uh, you know, the, how much damage should be done. But basically they're the same. The weapon power is different, but the little algorithm it uses to do those is basically the same. So what I want us to do, and I'm going to put the directions up here specifically because this is, again, a spot where you could do this multiple ways. Instead of having to Imagine that if statement with, that's figuring out how much weapon power or how much damage to do on this attack. Imagine that's an algorithm that's 20 lines long. So we really don't want to duplicate that algorithm between the Jedi ship and the normal ship. So I'm going to move the get single attack effectiveness. It's abstract inside of the abstract class right now. I want to move the implementation into your concrete class or sorry, make it concrete in abstract ship. So I'm going to move the algorithm into the abstract ship class. Okay? Now there are two tricky parts of that, right? Like the algorithm, if you look at that um, get single attack effectiveness in either of your classes right now, there's a dynamic part, or there's a part that's different between the two ship classes, and that's the weapon power, right? Because that's like a key ingredient into that. So we're gonna, if we move this method inside of the abstract ship, then there needs to be a way for that method to figure out what the weapon power is of the different classes so that I can put that as an input. So um, I'm actually going to simplify this here. So move get single attack effectiveness into the abstract class, but then create another abstract protected, well, abstract function. Hold on, I'm going to give you guys more details. Sometimes I realize as I say exercises, I was like, this exercise doesn't necessarily make sense without the following details. It'll make sense when I put it up here. So 
So if we move the get single attack effectiveness into the abstract chip class and make it a concrete method with the algorithm, we're going to need another abstract method called get weapon power. Because inside of that function, we're going to need to know like what's the weapon power because that's one of the inputs into that algorithm. So move the implementation up into abstract ship and then add another abstract function that we can use inside of the get single attack effectiveness. And the big picture here is um, we're using the abstract class for two reasons. Initially, and this is not really the job necessarily of an abstract class, initially we created the abstract ship with all abstract methods because that was our way of defining almost the schema. It was defining exactly what all ships must have. So in interface land, it's basically functioning as the interface, but it's not really an interface. So the first job, we, first way we're using the abstract ship was defining what methods must all ships have. And the second reason you use abstract classes, the more common one is because you want to share functions. So let's put some real functions inside of this abstract ship that can be used by all of its subclasses. So now we're going to move this get single attack effectiveness into that parent class so that we don't have to repeat it everywhere. And the end result of this is Jedi ship and normal ship, they still have to have an extra method, but instead of it being this get single attack effectiveness with this lines of code, we just have a get weapon power, which returns a number. And then all of the logic is in that central spot. So just a small step using a concrete method. We're going to go on. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. We have a third ship class. It's the Death Star. And the Death Star should never lose. Okay? So, go forth and create a new Death Star class. And just like with the Jedi ship, I want you to add it in ship loader so that you have a new Death Star. But I want you to make that class as much as you can. So, so obviously, the Death Star is going to extend abstract ship, because everything needs to extend abstract ship so far. But as much as you can, make the Death Star so that it never loses. Which for now, just means that we would set its defense and weapon power to huge amounts. Because of course, if we have a million, 10 million for defense, then probably it will never lose. There's nothing particularly new in this one. We're just sort of exercising our, um, our code so far. The cool thing is that um, because we have the abstract ship, um, it's very easy when we create a new ship class to know what methods we need. Because we just implement that and heck, you could refresh until you stop having errors. Refresh, you're missing this method. Oh, refresh, you're missing this method. Oh, I'll add that method. So the abstract ship is really giving us that vision of what our ship classes need to look like. Oh, by the way, um, I'm going to interrupt you, but on the previous step in abstract ship, we made, because I put it on the board like this, we made get weapon power protected. Why did we make it protected versus public? So that new protected, abstract protected function, get weapon power, that new abstract function lack step, why did I want you to make it protected and not public? Um, because only the, the child classes have to access uh, it. Perfect. That's exactly it. Yes. Because the only people that need to call this are the child classes. There's no one external in our application that ever needs to call um, get weapon power. So we want to keep our, the number of public functions we have in our class as low as possible because that makes it more obvious when I come to your project later and look at your ship objects, I say, oh, oh, get weapon power is protected. So I must, I shouldn't call that. 
if I need to do something with weapon power, I must need to do it some other way because some other developer has already told me this method is not meant to be used from the outside. It's just an internal thing, so you can't access it from the outside. In fact, that's the whole, I mean, not the whole reason, but that's the biggest reason for me um, why I make things private as often as possible and protect it as often as possible. Because if you make every function public, yes, it's very flexible, but it also means that a new developer or you six months from now, when you look at a class, you, you can't tell which methods are the important ones. So I have this class, it has 10 public methods, and I go, okay, I need to look through every single method and figure out which one is the one I want to call. Or I have a class and it has two public methods and eight private methods. I don't even need to worry about those. I can just look at the two public methods and say, these are the two methods I want to call. It's very simple. I can pretend like those other eight private methods don't exist. Also, if I need to do some refactoring on those private methods, I don't have to worry about breaking anything because the only people that are calling those private methods are inside this class. So you don't have to like grep your code base for who's calling this get weapon power function. It's private. So no one's calling it other than other things inside of this class. So one of the things when I see like bad projects, I do a lot of consulting. Um, it's sometimes it's when people just add a lot of public methods to their classes and then a team in the future is like, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what method to call. Good, 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 good. Okay, if you have problems, then then uh, if you're having problems, then look really confused, and then uh, Sasha will come help you. Um, okay, so we have the Death Star class. It extends abstract ship. Um, uh, it's a little bit awkward. You have to kind of follow me on this. It's a little bit awkward because I told you to make it like really, really awesome. So you said it's like we weapon power to like a billion. Um, so that the abstract function has like a lot of damage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really, it would be even easier if we didn't extend abstract ship, if we just filled in those methods directly. So let me say this a different way. What I'm driving at, what I've been driving at the whole time is ultimately, we don't really want an abstract class, we want an interface. We have our Death Star that extends abstract ship, but it doesn't really need to have a get weapon power function. It should almost just override the get single attack effectiveness itself and just return like a billion from that. Right now it returns get weapon power, which is used in that function, but we don't need that complication. We should just be able to say get weapon power, public function, get weapon power, return 10 million ourselves. So in this case, extending abstract ship, it's not that big of a deal, but we don't really need to. And in other cases, you would have it be even more obvious. Like if we had more um, real concrete methods inside of abstract ship that didn't really make sense for Death Star, then it would be even weirder for us to extend abstract ship. So ultimately, like we want to get here is an interface. And that's really what we did with the abstract class at first. When it was abstract and it only had abstract methods, that is an interface. It was a class that didn't do anything for you, except that it forced any classes that extended that to have to have those methods, right? So I'm assuming most people have used inter you have worked with interfaces, so if you know this already, then I'm repeating it, but just want to like say that again. The purpose of an interface is just that when you implement it, just like how we extended abstract ship, it guarantees that anything that implements that interface or extends abstract ship has those five important methods on it. So really, going back to that step where we created those five public abstract methods, we created those five methods because those were the five methods on ships that our application actually uses. In other words, the only thing that we care about is that when we call get ships, every object that's returned from that has those five methods. We don't really care if they extend abstract ship. If they do, cool. If they just really need to have those five methods. If they don't extend abstract ship, but they have those five methods, awesome. Okay? So, we're finally going to turn this into an interface. And then we're going to talk about the pros and cons of doing this, why you do this, why you might not do this step. 
So I want you to create a ship interface. And what goes into ship interface? It's the five methods that all ships must have, which happens to be the five public functions that you have in your abstract ship. So you'll move those five abstract functions from your abstract ship into the interface. And then you make the abstract ship implement that interface. So you'll have just five functions in your interface. And of course, the, they won't have implementation, right? They'll just be like public function, git defense, semicolon. So create a proper ship interface. And then make abstract ship extend that, or sorry, implement that. And then make Death Star. The advantage of this is now Death Star no longer has to extend abstract ship. It can just implement ship interface directly. It's like, oh, I don't need that garbage from abstract ship. I'm just going to implement ship interface. That's all I need. I'm good. In real life, I mean, this is a valid way to come to an interface. But in real life, if we are building this application together from the beginning, we might be able to sit and think, hmm, I'm going to need, I'm going to have many ship classes. So you might think from the very beginning, we know we're going to have many ship classes. What do they all have in common? What public methods do all of those ship classes, what are they going to need? And you might create an interface in, uh, like right at the beginning. So in that case, when you know you're going to have something complicated with many classes that all have something in common, you might create an interface immediately as a way to basically plan. It's your way of actually sitting down and thinking before you program, hmm, we're going to have ships. What methods do those ships have to have? Oh, they have to have these five methods. So let's create an interface with those five methods. And, and now we have a nice planning phase. Um, and then we know what all the future ship classes have to, what methods they have to have. You see, it makes your abstract ship class a lot prettier because it now has almost no methods in it. So um, as you were getting this working, one of the changes you made was in battle manager. You had to change the type hints on the battle function because it no longer accepts to abstract ship objects. It accepts ship interface objects. Yes? Um, so ultimately, right, that's, that's the power of interfaces is now when you accept an, a ship on a method, you can just say, all I need is a ship interface. I don't care if it's an abstract ship or a Death Star or a Jedi ship. All I need is a ship interface, which really helps clarify exactly what methods you need on any object passed in there. Now, this all looks really good, and, and interfaces have the really nice property of clarity. So for example, a lot of times in Symfony, we'll say, if you want to do this custom thing, all you need to do is create a class that implements that interface. And that's all we have to say. Because basically when you do that, all the directions for all the methods you need are in the interface. You can just look in the interface and say, oh, I need these three methods. Those methods probably have good documentation above them that say what they do. So you're done. So an example in Symfony, we have like form objects. If you want to create a form object, usually we use an abstract class, but technically, we just say, oh, just create a class that implements this uh, form type interface. Done. And then all the directions for what you have to do are in those methods. So that's really, really a powerful thing because it just really defines what you have to have in a class and what those things do. Now, there are disadvantages, and this gets totally subjective. So you're going to get like Ryan's opinion, and you guys can all yell at me and tell me I'm wrong if you want to. There's disadvantages to interfaces. And actually, you see it in that same spot in your code. The battle manager, that function that you now have type hinted with two ship interface objects. Well, the disadvantage of the interfaces, and in this case, we need an interface, because legitimately, we have three different classes, and they're very different, so we need an interface. But if I come to your project, or future you comes to your project, and I look in battle manager, and I look at that type hint, I can no longer tell exactly what type of object is passed to the battle function. I know it's a ship interface, but if I needed to look and see how it worked, how the ship object worked or changed something, I need to do a little more research to figure out what's actually passed there. Like I could say, oh, I actually see that there's a normal ship class and a uh, Jedi ship class and a Death Star class. You know, whereas before when we started, it said normal ship. That's what it was type-ended with. Very easy for me to go find the normal ship and go use it. 
So in this case, like I said, we do need an interface because we have three different implementations of it. But what I see a lot of times in people's code, like, like I mean, um, code you're writing for like your project or your company, uh, people will create interfaces all the time. So they'll be like, ah, oh, shiploader. Okay, I have a new shiploader class, shiploader interface. You're like, why? You don't need an interface. This is your code. If you need to change something in your shiploader, then just go change it in the shiploader. You don't need to have a class that has an interface when you have no intention for anything ever, for there ever to be two or three classes that also implement that interface. It just makes my job harder when I see shiploader interface type hinted somewhere, because now I have to go dig around and figure out what that thing is. When in reality, you, the developer that made it, you know it's a shiploader class. 100% of the time, there aren't multiple shiploaders. There never will be. And even if there were, then you could create the interface later. Okay? So, um, again, it's totally subjective, but when I code, and most of the code I write is for, probably like you guys, is for a company. I do do open source stuff, but most of the time I'm writing code to get something done. Um, you have to decide, is the code I'm writing going to be reused or not? Especially reused open source or not reused open source. Because if you're going to reuse something open source, the rules change. Everything needs to be an interface. Everything needs to be overridable. You, have, you can't hard code anything. If you're writing for your application, hard code it. Don't make an interface. Um, take shortcuts. I mean, don't get too much technical debt. But there are things you don't need to do. You don't need to create an interface for a shiploader in your code because you will only ever have that shiploader. If it's going to be open source, different story because you need to allow somebody to you know, use a different implementation of a shiploader, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, that's my rant. I do a lot of projects where I see like medium-ish developers who are, understand interfaces but don't have like the, I don't know, they're, they're like using them a little dangerously and there are like interfaces everywhere. And then the first thing I do is I go interface, delete, interface, delete, interface, delete, and just replace all of the type hints with the concrete class. And all of a sudden like, er, like the developers are like, oh yeah, this code suddenly makes a lot more sense. I just didn't know what this shiploader interface thing was. I couldn't tell. Now I know it's just this concrete class. Hmm? For example, switching uh, persistent layers. Yeah, I've never done it. It's never happened in a project. It, 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 it is happening with us. So, so changing, changing a, a service from MySQL to Solar, for, for example. So, because, because the uh, process is tedious, so, 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 so we actually must to have must have interface for that service, mm -hmm. so, so we, can, we can work on that in... in okay, yeah, so yeah, so good point. So now you're making an interface. Um, so so, so there's a situation there, like if you, knew, if you knew legitimately someday you might switch, like don't go crazy, right? There's like a 0.001% chance that you might switch in 10 years. Guess what? You're not going to switch. But if you're actually like there's a decent chance that you might switch in the future, then yeah, that's actually a good spot to say, okay, we should create an interface on this. You might need to switch it. That's a good case. You might need to switch it, so let's think about whether it's Solar or MySQL that we're using, like what would this function actually have to return? Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good example. Yeah, what, I think, what I think that I want to point out is that when you're building an open source project, you cannot predict how, us how users, how other developers will, will use your code, but when you uh, work on your project, you can predict how you will, and your team will use your code. And that uh, allows you to program to more, um, more to an implementation than to interfaces when you don't know how, how people will, will use your, your classes. So yes. you're making it as flexible as possible. Yeah, that's a good point. Or in this case, you actually, you were kind of like an open source project in that, where you're like, you don't really know how your implementation is going to look, or it might look one way, and you know it might change. So that's a good rule. Like, do I know how this is going to be used? Yeah, it's always going to be this shiploader class that uses PDO. Done. Then, then keep it simple. All right, we have time for one last thing here. Um, cool, so here's the problem. Or again, this is like Ryan giving you guys problems, so providing you problems all day long. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. Um, we want to do some caching in Shiploader. So instead of hitting the database every time, we're going to cache some of the results. We already have a service. You may have seen it in the config.yml. We already have a service that can cache things to the file system. We're not using it, but it's sitting in the container right now. So if we wanted to cache in shiploader, how could we do that? Extra requirement, actually, let me stay right there. If we wanted to do some caching in shiploader, what would be, what would be the steps to do that? What would you guys do? What code, let me, let me narrow it down. What code would you change in shiploader to start caching the results? 
Yeah, in Git ships, you would do. Yeah, I would just get the service. Bingo, yeah. I would just get the, get the uh, caching service, see if it's a hit. If it's not a hit, then get yep. the ship, store it, return it. Exactly. So you would get the caching service, which has some methods on it, probably like fetch, has, git, save, something like that. And then in git ships, right, you would check, oh, is my key in there? Yes, no, it's not. Make the, make the query and then set the results. So very, very easy, right? Um, the only thing that's interesting at all, and it's not really interesting for us anymore, is to get the caching service, you would have to add a second argument to the constructor, comma, after PDO, because it's another service that you need to, to inject into your object. So you add a second argument to your constructor, inject the caching service, set it on a property, and then use it. Then, of course, in config.yml, you would add a second argument in your service configuration so that Symfony knows to pass you the cache service. Cool? Um, so the complication now is... What if I need to be able to turn caching on and off sort of dynamically? Maybe locally I have it off and on production I have it on. So there's two ways to solve this. Um, one would be at this point you'd probably pass in some flag to your service, like a third argument that's like is caching on or is caching off. Um, or you could maybe pass in a, um, this is actually, this one would be a very valid one. You might somehow change your configuration so that when you're like locally, the object that's passed, that cache object that's passed to your, in your constructor, to your ship loader, maybe it's a cache object, but it doesn't really cache, it just fakes it. And that would work, right? As long as we type into that second argument with some cache interface, then we could change our configuration so that it doesn't pass it a file system cache or a Redis cache, it passes it like a, I don't know, it's, it's called a ray cache, but we'll call it like bullshit cache. You know, it doesn't actually cache. You know, that's what we pass in in the environments. Um, if we're creating an open source library for this ship loader, we might not want to do that. And the reason, well, re the reason we might not want to include caching if this were an open source library is because then you might get like more requests for things. Like I can't think of what they are, but you might get something where it's like, oh, you added caching to ship loader. Can you also like add something else so that when you call get ships, it like logs something? You're like, oh, okay, all right, let's add a third constructor argument for logging, except that the second argument is optional because not everyone caches, and the third argument is optional because not everyone logs. Or maybe you add a set cache and a set log. But the point is you can like, add more and more stuff to that class that you don't necessarily need. Yeah? What I would do in that case, I would decorate the ship loader to uh, have a cached ship loader. That's, like why we pay, that's why we pay him the big bucks. <laughs> So, uh, like, you have a loggable ship loader and stuff like that. So, like, different services that uh, uh, decorate the original implementation with some extra functionality. Exactly. So, you, you still have the ship loader, but you have a cache ship loader and so on. And you'll see this in, like, open source projects all the time. So, and this is actually what we're going to do in this next step. Let me put it up here. Um, and it's actually steps 11 and 12 at the same time, and it's the last thing that we'll do. You basically create a, you leave ship loader alone. That, and you ship your open source project with that, done. And now somebody else, or maybe you also do it in your open source project, whatever, or in your project, you create another class called cacheable ship loader. And it has the same methods as ship loader. In other words, it implements the same interface. We don't have a ship loader interface yet. We'll need to create one. So basically you create a class that looks and smells just like ship loader, has all the same methods as ship loader, and you actually pass the real ship loader into it as an argument. And then in your application, when you call get ships, you don't call get ships on the ship loader anymore. You call get ships on the cacheable ship loader. And inside of it, it checks to see if there's a cache hit. And if there isn't, it calls the ship loader, sorry, it calls get ships on the real ship loader. So we end up with a cacheable ship loader like this. And then we, that's why it's decoration. A cacheable ship loader is what we actually call. And inside of it is the real ship loader and we kind of decorate it that way. Okay, so if that didn't make sense, I'll say it again. That was a mediocre explanation at best. So inside of the installation slash files directory, I have a cacheable ship loader. It has most of the code that you need. All you need to do inside of there is update git ships to use the cache. And if the cache isn't there, like if it's, if it's not a cache hit, then to call the git ships method on the ship loader that's inside of it. 
So that'll make a little more sense when you look at the way that class is set up. So this will be the last thing we do. It's this, really the whole thing is this step and the next step. So I'm gonna actually like put some code up here in a second. So we can kind of do this together. This one's a little bit tricky. When it all comes together, you're like, oh yeah, I get that. It'll, it's gonna make really good sense. Sorry, I'm gonna switch off this for a second. So the part you have to fill in is basically this git ships, and this is what it should look like. So we're, I want to make sure we get through this, so, that, so I'm, 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 letting, I'm giving you guys a little bit more first. So it's just, it's classic cache checking, right? Like, is my item in the cache? Yes, return, else, go do the work, put it in the cache, and return it. So the real important thing is here is how you notice that it's, it's literally decorated. It's like, do some stuff, but maybe we call the parent ship loader because this arrow ship loader is the real ship loader. So the advantage of this, and again, don't go overboard with like your actual client code, but the advantage of this is ship loader gets the new magic power of caching without ship loader itself needing to change. We didn't have to add a whole bunch of garbage to shiploader. Shiploader is still just doing its one simple job. And now there's a different shiploader, which is the cacheable shiploader, which adds this caching thing, but then falls back to calling the real shiploader internally. Now this is a case where, and this, it's, this is actually like the next step, but you can get into it already because um, you need this to work. This is where, well, you don't have to. You don't have to if you don't type hint, but now we are going to need a shiploader interface because there is one service, it's the um, random ship selector. It has a constructor argument, which is the shiploader. And right now it's type hinted with shiploader, the concrete class. So if you do this and get this kind of set up, um, you're going to have an error because ultimately you're going to try to inject the cacheable ship loader into, the, uh, into that class and it's going to explode because cacheable ship loader is not the same as ship loader. So in this case, we're going to need a ship loader interface. We're going to need something that cacheable ship loader and ship loader have in common so that if we ever have a type hint for a ship loader, we just say, look, I don't care. I just need to, to have a ship loader interface object that of course just has a you know, get ships and maybe get random ship on it. And then that's all I need. So there's a few steps in here, so I'm jumping around in details. Yep, 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 yep. I really want to get this one up there. Sorry, cheating.
There we go. So step one here is we created this cash flow ship loader. Step two was we made that a service. And you can see we're passing the real ship loader into the cash flow ship loader. That's the decoration part, an object inside of an object. And of course, you pass it that ship cash I already have set up. And then for the random ship selector, which you guys already have, we're just changing the implementation. We're saying, hey, you know what we should do? Instead of passing the random ship selector, instead of passing that the cacheable ship loader, we want it to, or sorry, instead of passing it the normal ship loader, pass it the cacheable ship loader. We're almost like tricking it. We're saying, look, uh, random ship selector, you, right now you are getting, expecting a ship loader. We're just going to change what that ship loader is on you. We're going to go behind the scenes and all of a sudden give you a cacheable ship loader. And basically, there's one other complication, which is the interface uh, I've mentioned. But basically, this is it. This is the pattern of decoration, which is a different way of solving in addition to a class. Like I said, we could have added caching to shiploader directly. We could have also made a new cacheable shiploader that extends shiploader, right? That would have been fine. Um, or we could have done this method. The advantage of doing this method technically versus like, why would I do this method versus having casual shiploader extends shiploader? Technically, again, especially if I were doing an open source project, it would be because ultimately we would have a shiploader interface that both casual shiploader implements and shiploader implements. If we use this method here, then if I'm using this library, I could actually use the cacheable shiploader from this library, but replace the shiploader. I could be like, no, 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 I don't need your garbage shiploader. I'm going to make my Ryan shiploader. That's my real shiploader. It loads from Redis instead of MySQL. But I could still pass the Ryan shiploader into cacheable shiploader as long as it implements this, this shiploader interface that we don't have yet. And I could still take advantage of caching. So the cacheable shiploader is not hard-coded to work with the normal shiploader. It, we can pass any shiploader into it, anything that implements that interface, and it's got that flexibility. Now, in your project, you might not care. You might say, you know what, it's just a little easier. Cache will ship loader, extend ship loader. We'll just override the get ships function, do the look, cache lookup, done. And that's totally fine. Just realize the problem with that is that you, are, you have to use ship loader. Somebody can't use your library and swap out the ship loader for something that loads from Redis. Maybe not a problem in your project, but a problem in open source projects. So that's why you do this method. Um, so like I said, the only missing piece here is that we actually need a ship loader interface which you guys can totally go and create right now. Um, or if you want to get this to work, just the quick and dirty way, you need to remove the type hint on the random ship selector. Because right now, if you refresh the page with this, it's going to pass a cacheable ship loader to random ship selector. But in its construct function, it has a type hint for the sh concrete ship loader. So you're going to get a, like something like, argument one passed to construct of random ship selector, expected ship loader, received cacheable ship loader because they don't implement the same interface. So you can create an interface, um, which is really the right way to solve this, or you can just take that type hint off and then put a comment there and say, Ryan told me to do this dirty hack thing. It's his fault. And then you'll be totally fine because they really do have the same methods. All right. All right, so they're, um, they're kicking me out because we're out of time. We basically, got every, we basically got everything done. I had like one or two little steps, but that, this, by the way, this is called composition, this decorating pattern, composition. Sometimes you hear like composition versus inheritance. That's the argument of should I take an object and put one into it or should I make my cacheable shiploader extend inheritance? 
extend the normal ship loader. So this is composition, and you can see the advantages. Many more advantages for open source projects, but something to keep in mind with your project. Um, it's a nice pattern. It kind of keeps, keeps your classes uh, smaller. Um, cool. There is a branch called Finish. Very creative name. So if you check out to the Finish branch, you can see like, what my code looked like at the finish of this. Um, hopefully it looks similar to your code, uh, but maybe not. Um, maybe there's some differences in there. Uh, also, go to events.netgen.io. That's that cool page you've hopefully you've already been to. You can vote on uh, this workshop. Um, you could probably technically vote on workshops that you didn't go to, but uh, other than increasing your chances to win the prize, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. And you can spam uh, comments there and, um, you know, and then tell Eva that I told you to do it. So you can put lots of comments on there. Um, also, uh, Camp University is like the online site I use. There's a coupon code there. You can use that, have that up for like two days or so. So if you create an account, you can get a free month subscription. We have like a ton of screencasts on there. We do have stuff on object-oriented. It might be at this point a little on like the lower level for you guys. But if you want to brush up on stuff or you have a developer on your team that's like still kind of getting into it, then take them through the OO stuff. And there's a ton of Symphony stuff on there, so whatever you want. Um, cool. If you are still working on that and are interested in getting it done, then stick right here. Otherwise, you guys are free to run around. And the next thing starts in here in 10 minutes. Cool. But, you know, run around and, like, swim in the pool and ride your bike before in the next 10 minutes. And, you know, thanks for putting up with me. <laughs>